I thank you, Dr. Obehi, for your second invitation extended to me in order to speak to your community about the religion and the spirituality of ancient ages. Hello, and welcome to Obehi Podcast. I'm your host, Obehi Ewafo, and I strongly believe that everyone has a story to share. Now, let's get started with this episode. Years ago, I was reading the first book of the channel. I was trying to discover the main teaching of the Limba, the greatest Congo traditional academy of civil mystery. The reason I was pouring this book was that the author, the author has talked with the last initiates of this school. So my conviction was that he was told the great spiritual secret of the Lemba. After reading the book for more than five times, the secret, the secret was still eluding me. I prayed and was then led to ponder one of the songs of Lemba contained in that book. I read it in connection with the first epistle of John, chapter three, verse one to three. The convergence between the song and the citation of the Bible was made clear to me and was even extended to the religion of ancient Egypt. It is said in 1 John that we are now children of God. But what we will be have not yet been manifested. Now, it is clear that in heaven we will be children of God. This implies that we are so now only potentially. And the hope for being it in a manifest way is to practice the purification of our thoughts. I realize that the same schema was taught in Lemba and is found in the Egyptian Book of the Dead. In that book, the personage called Osiris Ani claims the right in the beyond to be an Osiris. The exegesis of this account reveals that Osiris means a child of God. The reason for the request of Osiris Ani is that he has lived a life of purity on earth. Since his name is Osiris and he claims the right to be an Osiris, we conclude that he was an Osiris only potentially and was claiming the right to become so in a manifest way. Thus, religion in ancient ages was the means to regain one's lost ability to be a manifest child of God, to be a Nazareth, an ability lost due to our own original and subsequent bad uses of the God-given free will. In his History of Science, Smith Williams insists that All Egyptian science is eminently practical. According to that nature, any text of the Egyptian religion is intended either to have the initiate regain the nature of child of God he has lost, or it is intended to hide the divine truth from the foreigners, that is, from the inquisitive Christian students. To hide the religious teachings from the foreigners was one of the obsessions of the Egyptian. The Egyptian priests devised a dilatory schema to keep the Christian away from the divine mystery. They obliged them to start with interminable study of human mystery to be qualified for the study of the divine. The reluctance 
of the Egyptian to open the access to their religion to foreigners is seen also in the fact that after conquering the land of the pharaohs, the Grecian asked one of the Egyptian priests they have found in Siru to conceive a cult for them. Instead of revealing to his new masters the religion of his ancestors, Manetho, the said priest, rather composed for them a false, false new doctrines, the cult of Apis, a religion based on the worship of a bull. Therefore, when reading a text of the Egyptian religion, we must bear in mind that it is intended either to participate in helping the initiate to regain the manifest expression of his true nature as a child of God, and Osiris, or it is just myths intended to hide the divine truth from foreigners. There were three main schools of theology in ancient Egypt, the Memphite, the Hermopolitan, and the Elipolitan. Though these three teachings are different, the Egyptian did not see them as contradictory, but as complementary. Thus, we base our knowledge of the religion of Egypt on the theology of Memphis. The first nature of the Egyptian religion is its hierarchical mon monotheistic nature. The existence of a supreme being on the banks of the Nile is affirmed by the text of the pyramids, which calls him the sole lord, and by the Egyptian Book of the Dead, which alludes to him as one lord. Two similar expressions. This last book confirms also the existence of the Supreme Being by calling the Creator Ra, child, a child of God, a firstborn. This implies the existence of a higher realm in connection, in connection to which the Creator is a child. Many would contend that the evidence for the existence of a supreme being is too slim to be considered as valid. Here, I must denounce a schema used by the West to disparage other religions of the world. When a doctrine appears once only in the Bible, the common line of defense of its validity is that God doesn't depend on statistical criterion, and truth is his revelation. I, for one, insist that the same schema must be used for the religion of ancient Egypt, because the Black people conceive revelation to be the very nature of the epistemic, the ages. This is confirmed in ancient Egypt by the depiction of the soul as a bird or a butterfly hovering over the head of a person. God, the Most High, was conceived in ancient Egypt to be transcendent. This nature is seen in the fact that prayers were never addressed directly to him. The highest God to whom prayers were directly addressed is Atom, the solar creator of this temporal universe. It should be added that the nearest gods through whom requests are made to the heavens are the dead gods, our holy ancestors. Thus, we have, thus as we said above, the monotheism of ancient Egypt is a hierarchical one. The most high thrones above lower divinities that are about his manifestations. This we don't, thus we don't have to confuse 
the modern phase of ancient Egyptian with polytheism, which implies many independent deities. The religion of ancient Egypt starts with the cosmogony, the account of the beginning of the temporal universe. It is recounted that at the beginning, the heaven and the earth were united. The earth here stands for the temporal plane of the existence, while the heaven stands for the eternal realm. Alluding to this unity, the Egyptian religion says that their waters were united, which implies that both state of consciousness was united. Since God was conceived to be perfect good, that is without any knowledge of evil, hence his transcendence, this unity of evil and good implied that evil was only potential. This conjunction of evil and good is consonant with the very nature of creation in black culture, where it is not ex nihilo, as in the West. In Africa, to be created is to go from the potential existence to a manifest one. The African cosmogony teaches that potentially everything exists, but only the good had a manifest existence before the beginning. The potential existence is what is, what is called in ancient, exist, liter, in ancient Egyptian literature, the noon. The Egyptian religion teaches that the Most High has endowed his children with free, free will. The bad use of free will cause the evil, the evil to go from potential existence to the manifest one. Therefore, to preserve the purity of heaven, the god star separated the earth, now manifest evil, from the heaven, manifest eternal good. Due to the bad use of his free will, the lost child of God fell in a state of consciousness characterized by chaos and darkness. He has become a non-incarnated spirit groping in muddy water. That is the chaotic original nature of the temporal universe as a consciousness. In the heaven, a conclave of the gods, including the creator, decided to have the lost children of God. Thus, the God at turn left the heavenly realm to reach the lost children of God. Creation happens in the consciousness of the creator, like the eternal realm exists in the consciousness of the Most High. In the process of creation, Atom was helped by Psa. According to James, the author of Stalin Legacy, Atom performed creation after having swallowed Ta. Now Ta is represented by the air, the breath, that is the word. Hence, creation was performed by the power of the divine word. The fact that Atom is prompted by Ta to create in the name of the Most High reveals the Egyptian principle of Trinity. The unity of the solar atom and ta. The iconographic representation of this Trinity depicts Osiris, Isis, and Horus. Thus, Osiris stands for God. The conjunction of, of Osiris and Isis represents the wholeness of the, of the divinity of the Lagos, and Horus stand in the sin as the child of God. We said above that creation consists in making something go from the potential states 
of existence to a manifest one. Due to this, the creator is depicted in Africa as being a potter, an architect, a blacksmith, etc. In all these instances, the original material of creation is already available. The creator doesn't create it, but he only gives it a form. Alluding to this, a Congo proverb says, This means that has a potter. Has a potter gives a form to a lump of clay. The creator did only have the non-incarnated spirits to take a temporal manifest form in order to begin the ascension back to the heavenly plane. Creation is a process, a journey out of an abyss. This abyss is portrayed in the imagination of the Black people as a neddy of water, spiraling clockwise and situated in the east. The east here is the land where the sun rises, Africa the motherland of humanity. This is the meaning of the black hole in the cosmology of the Africans. It is, a, it is the locus of the temporal universe. Thus, by turning clockwise, one falls in the black hole, while the counterclockwise Ascension is a movement out of the temporal realm to reach the heaven. By turning away from God, the lost child of God has lost the manifest expression of his divine childhood. That is the expression of the fullness of the divinity. This fullness is symbolized by the conjunction of the male nature and the female. However, due to the transcendence of God and due to the fact that potentially everything exists, the divine nature of the child of God, that is you and me, is still in him, but reduced to a potential state. According to the Egyptian cosmology, everything in the temporal realm is only the manifestation of its true nature in the eternal realm. The temporal realm is only a dream from which the lost children of God have to be awakened by the loving presence of God surrounding, them, surrounding him and by the loving presence of God inhabiting him. Thus, we know that like in God's, human being were conceived as being male and female, that is, as including the divine completeness, the word. Horus is this loving presence of God in the human being, the temporal expression of Ta, the word. To express this nature of Horus, the Egyptian book of the dead, portrays him as affirming, I'm Horus, the inhabitant of the heart in the inhabitant of the body. Moreover, Horus is the advocate of Osiris Ani, pleading his right to become an Osiris, a manifest child of God, because he has lived a life of purity. We are thus taught that Osiris Ani could not reach salvation by his own means. In other words, in other words, salvation in ancient, in ancient Egypt, Egyptian religion is firstly for the word by the agency of Ares. However, since the heaven is since in the heaven, as in the heavens, 
the God are respectful of the free will God has endowed his children with. Salvation is secondly through one's sanctification of his being. We have said above that any text of the Egyptian religion is either intended to show the practical import of its doctrine. That is how to regain the lost manifest expression of the divine childhood or it is intended to hide the divine truth from the foreigners, that is the inquisitive Christian students. How can we distinguish these two natures? In order to distinguish these two intents of the Egyptian writer of spiritual doctrines, we must know that according to Tilaloa, the modern academy of African traditional spirituality that we founded and manage, the religion of ancient Egypt is an exact science. The scientific nature is, is demonstrated by establishing the congruence which exists between this religion and the Kemeti cosmological argument. A cosmological argument is an attempt to demonstrate the existence of the creator of this temporal universe by starting from the existence of the cosmos. The Kemeti cosmological argument starts from two premises, the existence of individualities in this temporal plane and the law of causality, which of an effect matches a cause adequate and anterior. The Kemeti cosmological argument can be introduced summarily in, this, in the following manner. The individual nature of our temporal universe has a collection of individual entities makes of it a product of an individual cause. In the infinity of possibilities, the individuality of this cause implies the existence of all the other similar causes. Each of these different causes can be effective or potential. That is, having already or not having yet created a temporal universe. Under the hypothesis that every creation exists in its creator, a non-indispensable hypothesis and produced only for the sake of brevity, there is a being that includes the sum total of these potential and manifest causes. This latter being is therefore the greatest possible being. He is that the most high God. It follows that has the greatest possible being, the Most High is absolutely immutable and indivisible. For a mutable and divisible God who require the existence of a principle of his mutability and divisibility. Now, according to the law of causality, such a principle must be greater than God that is greater than the greatest possible being, this is impossible. Being indivisible, the greatest possible entity and the greatest possible entity, the most high must be transcendent. That is, he is above all and doesn't know evil. Under the indivisible nature of his being, the knowledge of evil will imply that God is infinitely good and infinitely bad, which is an ontological impossibility. We have seen that each effective and potential creator expresses an individuality included in the Most High. Now the Most High is indivisible. Does each creator in other words, each child of God expresses the wholeness of God, but in an individual manner. We call this wholeness the Logos. 
Thus, we have three celestial entities, God, the Father, Mother, the Creators, the Children of God, and the Logos. The indivisible nature of the Most High implies that there is a unity of the Father, Mother, the Child of God, and the Logos. They are one in existence, in substance, and in activity. This is solar trinity. It can be illustrated this way. If one is in front of a mirror, the power of the reflection of the mirror and, the, and his image in the said mirror form along with him a trinity. When he moves, his image moves thanks to the power of the reflection of the mirror. When the image moves, it is him who moves in it thanks to the power of the reflection of the mirror. Now the Logos is the power of the reflection of the wholeness of God in the child of God. A question arises here. Where does creation occur in relation to the Most High? Creation cannot happen in the Most High because he is absolutely immutable. If creation were to happen in him, then something new would appear in him and God will change. Creation cannot happen outside of God. Otherwise, added to the Most High, these will result in an entity greater than God, greater than the Supreme Being, which is impossible. However, we, knows, we know that all reality is in God, and that by aquasesis, creation occurs in the Creator. It thus follows that creation is only a limited perception of the celestial reality in the temporal consciousness of the creator. The visible is only an appearance of the invisible. In other words, the reality is spiritual. Reality is never material, according to the chemical cosmological argument. The chemical cosmological argument has revealed to us the existence of the following, the following elements, theological element. First, this, the existence of the supreme being who is transcendent. Second, potential, the existence of potential and effective creators which implied the existence of many parallel temporal universes. Three, the existence of a creator of this temporal realm. Four, the existence of the Logos has the manifestation of the fullness of God in his children. Five, the existence of Trinity or the unity of God the child of God and the Logos in the substance, existence, and activity. Six, the apparent nature of the temporal realm. These doctrines are exactly the depiction of the theological points of the religion of ancient ages as enumerated above. Now, the committee cosmological argument is a set of deductive covering truths. Thus, it is an exact science. Therefore, the congruence which has been established between the cosmetic cosmological argument and the theology of ancient Egypt implies that the religion of ancient Egypt was an exact science. In summary, the spirituality taught in ancient ages was the practical, the practice of divine mystery has an exact science. 
this practice was at its highest articulation the implementation of the purification of self in order for the initiate to regain the manifest expression of the fullness of God. Ta, a manifesting that he has lost due to his own original and subsequent bad uses of his God-given free will. The salvation of human beings human beings is the result of the grace of God through Horus, the temporal expression of Ta, the Lagos. But it is also the acceptation of this grace by human beings through the sanctification of their souls. The Egyptian religion was a practical one and a scientific episteme. Thank you. For those that are listening to us, uh, this is an argument on, um, on religion and spirituality of Asian Kemet. And uh, as we can see, a, a way and a very clear illustration has been given. So this way we're going to be starting it. And now, uh, one thing I would like to ask from you, at least also for the people that are listening to us is, to understand why did you decide to pick up this study on the religion and spirituality of Asian Kemet? What is the sense of it? Why do we even need to know it? We need to know it because the religion of ancient Egypt is the original nature of the religion of the Black people. Now, we have been convinced that our religion is a superstitious one, a devilish one. It is witchcraft. We have been told that the religion of the West is the highest one. It is a science. Now, thanks to the Kemetic cosmological argument, we can prove that the original nature of the religion of the black people, which is the religion of ancient Egypt, is an exact science, which means that ours is the highest form of religion because the Western lexicographers recognize that religion for them is just a belief, which means that their religion is a mere belief. Now, ours is a science. So it is good for us to know this in order to defend our religion. This is the first thing. The second thing is that we are, we are planning, we, we are eager to see the unity of Africa. Now, according to Sheikh and Tariyab, that unity must be a cultural one first. However, Africa includes many cultures. So it is difficult to make the unity of the African cultures. But this can be done to the, to the unit, unit, the spiritual unity. Because the, the, the religion of ancient Egypt was an exact science. And because the religion of the Congo people is the continuity of that religion of ancient Egypt. We can explain all the, the trends of the African traditional religion by using that scientific nature. In other words, I mean that every trend of the African traditional religion is only a lost of a key element that made it go from a scientific knowledge to a belief. So we can help it regain its scientific nature. Thus, we will be speaking the same spiritual language all over Africa, and Africa will be spiritually united. And Africa, spiritually united, will be also in Africa economically and politically united because the basis of African knowledge is the basis of Africa 
praxis is religion. Thank you so much for that. That is uh, very important. Yeah, it is true. Any person who just uh, take a look at Africa today uh, understand that uh, in Africa we practice a form of spirituality. Okay, I don't even know that is spirituality. A kind of regimentized religion that are completely different from from us. Uh, where we need to hold allegiance to forces that are outside Africa, uh, and to the Christian and to Islam. Uh, these are things that are controlled from outside the African uh, territory and outside the African uh, seat of power. So it means somebody else is telling us how to live and how to die, and when we die, where we go. I would think they are just simple, but they are not simple. They are very um, deep, and uh, that is where they actually control us. So it is important that we understand that we actually have the fundamentals of what can be um, our way of living in this world, which is our spirituality. Uh, talking of uh, African spirituality, uh, you see, you, you, you know that um, they want us to believe that, because now we are talking of Asian Kemet, which is Egypt, no? They want us to believe that Egypt is not even Africa, at least that is how many Westerners want to see it, because uh, every other thing in Africa could for then, it was easy to write, to be written, of, to be written out of history, that Africans don't have history. But well, because uh, Egypt is actually where uh, African civilization have got it to its zenith, and the evidence is too much to be written off, uh, they look for a way to say, okay, this one can be taken out of Africa, but they still haven't been able to prove that the geography of Egypt. It's actually anything other than Africa. But within their psychology, within their thinking, Egypt is not Africa. And therefore, we're talking of this part now, which is the Asian Kemet or Asian Egypt, if you want to use the way the, the European one prefer to call Egypt. So by Egyptian or by Asian Kemet spirituality, are we talking of anything different from Africa? Are they, did they practice something that is different from the rest of Africa? Or do we have a kind of a coronation, a kind of similarity in other parts of Africans, another part of Africa where we are talking of the Asian Kemet spirituality? Let me understand that. Yes, I, do, I did understand. I, I know that the Western people are reluctant to acknowledge that Egypt belongs culturally to Africa. Now, I have spoken of a schema here. I've said that there, there have been an obsession among Egyptians to hide, to hide spiritual truth from Grecian students. For example, when Pythagoras went to Egypt in order to learn, it was thought that he had to begin first with human teaching, human mystery. And he spent 20 years studying human mystery in order to be qualified for the study of divine mystery, which was just a dilatory schema. And not a single Grecian student was taught that religion. That religion was hidden to them. Now, we know that that religion was an exact science. We have proven this. And nobody can deny this proof because the Kemetic cosmological argument can be extended to the, to the doctrines of a salvation of religion. It is the first time in the known history of humanity that natural theology has been extended to a systematic natural theology. So the chemical cosmological argument is an exact science. And we have proven, we have demonstrated that the religion of ancient Egypt is congruent with the chemical cosmological argument. And this demonstration, demonstration has been made in our book titled Bukongo, which is available at Amazon. Now, 
we have also proven, uh, demonstrated that the religion of the Congo people, the Bukongo, is congruent also with the Kemeti cosmological argument. Now, considering the southward migration of the black people, now we know that the Congo religion, the Congo, is also congruent with the Kemeti cosmological argument. So, considering the migration of the black people from the north to the south, we can say that the religion of ancient Egypt is the original nature of the religion of the black people. And therefore, the religion of the black people, the religion, the Congo problem, the, 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 the religion of the black people is congruent with the religion of ancient Egypt. This relationship is a theological proof of the unity of ancient Kemet and the black people. Now, this theological unity cannot be made between ancient Egypt and Persia, neither within ancient Egypt and Greece. So this is one more proof that we are the Egyptian. And this is one more proof of the kinship between ancient Egypt and the black people, because the one thing that, that was kept sacred by the ancient Egyptian, Egyptians is found among the black people. So they are the ancient Egyptians. Another thing, uh, actually, that um, I'm trying to understand uh, just now is um, because you did make mention of the uh, salvation religion, no? <laughs> yes, yes, the, salvation religion. Okay, so I don't know if you want to uh, expand on that a little bit uh, because I am trying to see if there is any connection between ancient Kemet's uh, spirituality, uh, the Abrahamic religion, for example. Yes, there is a connection because the same schema of salvation is found in the Abrahamic religion and in mostly in Christian in Christianity and in the religion of ancient Egypt. The Osiris Ani was an Osiris, the child of God, potentially. And in the beyond, he claims the right to be a child of God, an Osiris, in a manifest way. Now we find the same schema in the Bible, in, in the first epistle to jo uh, of John, chapter 3, verse 1 to 3, where we are said that we are children of God. And we shall be children of God in heaven. But for, for, for us to be children of God in heaven, we have to purify ourselves. We share the same schema. It means that we are children of God potentially. We, we shall be, be so in a manifest way if we purify ourselves. So the same schema was used. What does it mean? It means that... Those who wrote the Bible has, ha, ha, had, has taken, has stolen the material of the Egyptian and the Sumerian, because the Sumerian and the Egyptian belong to, this, belong to the same culture. So what we have in the Bible is only a stolen, it was stolen from the culture of Sumer, and from the culture of ancient Egypt. The Greek first did that, and then the Roman. The Roman cop copied things in the library of Alexandria, and after having copied, they, 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 burned, they burned the library. But they didn't know that all those things that were written in the library were all sold, in in the in the tombs, so they were there. They could be found there. As a, the burning of uh, uh, the library could it actually be an accident or was it a deliberate act? Is there anything we can trace to that? Because that is an important part now. We think that it was it was done deliberately in order to hide the truth because they knew that they were making copies. If you make copies, 
then you, your intent will be to destroy the original in order for you to, to hide your cheating. So we think that it was intended to hide the truth. And the same schema was used for the African culture. We have been told, that, for example, that the black people didn't have books, the black people didn't have, uh, didn't have uh, scriptures before the arrival of the colonizer. Now, this is false. For example, for the Kingdom of Congo, when the colonizers, the Portuguese, came, the first thing they did was to burn our books. Do we know that at that moment the books were the parchment, and the parchment was very expensive, so that they were just few, and they burned. They did burn them after they came with the story that we didn't have any scripture, we didn't have books. So you see, the same schema is used, is used, was used over and over by the white people. They destroy your culture, and they 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 they, they come later to say that you didn't have it. <laughs> I, I would like you to spend some time there, because you know <laughs> the British now, uh, after the invasion of Benin, what they call the Punitive War, they also burned down Benin City. And they destroy the artifacts. Uh, of course, after they have stolen a lot from me, they burn down the rest. And of course, many Europeans will now come to say, ah, these people do not have any history. After the same people have destroyed it. So tell me a little bit more about this deliberate attempt to destroy. Of course, it is difficult now to destroy the pyramid. So they have to claim it as part of Western culture, not an African culture. Uh, they didn't manage to destroy the great period, the great uh, Zimbabwe. Uh, that one must have been made by some uh, Jews that are roving around in Africa, uh, some Europeans who were lost in Africa. There was even the speculation that the ancient world of Benin, uh, at one time it was said to be the lost city of Atlantis, that the people of Benin were just there by accident, even though the war was actually built by the Benin people to protect them from enemy and many other things so tell me more about this the burning of the books in in congo i think we need to uh, talk more about this yes you are you are you are speaking of benin do you know that the benin people did have the hieroglyph they didn't have a, this a scripture a way of writing which is similar to the egyptian but which is not the same so their history was written by using that way of writing. But all of this has been destroyed. If you read the first book re written by a white people about, about the, 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 the Congo Kingdom, the book, the book is called A Report of the Kingdom of Congo by Pigafetta. If you read that book, in that book he says that when the European people arrived in the Kingdom of Congo, they, con they convinced the king that their religion was the right one. And the black people, religion, and their statutes were only superstitious things that had to be burned. But Pigafetta mentions that they did not only burn the artifacts, they did burn also books of magic. So we have to ask ourselves, to whom belong those book, books of magic? They could not belong to the white people because they were supposed to burn all the black people's things. And they were they were new arrival, new new arriving people. So those books of magic belonged to the black people. Now we know we know that when the when the European came to Africa, they had the knowledge of the paper. While the African people and the, uh, mostly the the, pe the bunch of people didn't know about the use of the paper. They knew only the use of the parchment. So that when 
the white people showed to them the paper book. The Congo people said, ah, oh, it is a skin. So they called it a skin, which means Nkanda. So they could not call it a skin if they didn't have the skin which they used for writings. So you see, we had books. The Benin people had writings. All of this has been destroyed. The schema of the white people was to destroy in order to say that we didn't have something like that. Now, I'm staying in Brazzaville. If you go in the north of the Congo Brazzaville, they will tell you the history of a traditional practitioner. I forgot his name. He was living in, in, in a town called Eniele. Now, in Eniele, that guy was performing a surgery, a traditional surgery. He, he opened the belly of someone. As, as he was operating, a white man, a white man arrived. It was in the colonial time. The white man arrived and he was astonished that nobody cared about coming to welcome him. But he saw everybody made in a circle and someone was inside performing something. So he came near and he saw that that guy was operating someone, practicing a surgical integration. So after he finished, he took away the disease, he put two leaves of a tree and the wound disappeared. So you, you know what he, the black, the white man did? He arrested that man, that, sir, that physician, traditional physician. And he told him, you must show me what you did. So they arrested him, they tortured him in order for him to show to them what he did. And later on, the, the man was found dead. All right, this is what we are talking about. The European cultural genocide in Africa. Of course, nobody ever think of that, that there is a genocide in Africa. If I the genocide against African people are uh, with S, genocides to eradicate our culture. Uh, today, let me just give you an instance. In some parts of Nigeria, uh, particularly in the south, uh, because in the north, of course, we have uh, Islam. They are equally as confused as those in the south, only that I'm talking of the south, no? where uh, people are worshipping uh, Jesus. So they claim to be born again. Uh, in many of the cases, these are not European, uh, these are African people, these are Nigerian. They go to the shrine of the, of the local shrine, they will burn it down, they will, they will say that it's a devil there. They were told that it's a devil there, they will burn down the ancestral shrine of the people. But this is where it becomes very interesting. When among these people, the same people that they are burning their shrine, they don't have any problem with you because you are a Christian. But you that is a Christian have problem with them because they are not Christian. That is already very problematic. Why are you destroying things? Why are you destroying the way of life of the people? I don't know if it's only happening in Nigeria or it's also happening in Congo, like you know. Uh, I mean, the Africans that are destroying their whole African religion and spirituality because they believe that they are born again in Christianity. You know, this is something inherited from the West. Because before the arrival of the West people, we never have been taught of the Yoruba people going to, to convert the Fon people. We never hear about the Congo people going to convert the people of uh, the Luba people, for example. No. Whenever two ethnic came together, they were an ex 
exchange of divinities because they knew that they were in the same religion. If you look at the Vodou of the phone, you will find some divinities of the Yoruba inside. And the black people don't see any contradiction in that. So there were no proselytism in Africa. The proselytism came with the white people. And with that, they were telling people that you have to convert the others. You have you have to you have to find the other because they are not in your religion, they are in the darkness, you are in the light. So that mentality we have to fight. We have to fight it. How are we going to fight it? By uniting in our own true religion. By showing people that the highest religion is not the white people's religion. By we use his own standard. The standard of the black of the white people is that religion, the true epistemic, must be a science. Now we have demonstrated that ours is a scientific religion, an exact science. Theirs is the belief. This is one of the points we, we must capitalize on it to show them that know how a traditional religion is superior to Christianity and is superior to all the, all the other religions. This is the first thing. The second thing, the white people cannot demonstrate the validity of his theism. He claims that his is true monotheism, and it is the belief that the supreme being is the creator. This is known by the Western scholar to be a logical impossibility. Why? Because you have to ask yourself just one question. Where does creation occur? If creation occurs in the Most High, that is, in the Most High Creator, then at the moment of creation, something in him goes from non-existence to existence, that God changes. And if God changes, there might, there must be the, a principle of his mutability, and that principle must be higher than God, which is impossible. Now, maybe creation happens outside of God. But if creation happens outside of God, then added to God, it will result in an entity greater than God. So all the scholars in the West, the, the good scholars in the West, knows this. They know that it is impossible to have a most high God who is at the same time the creator, which means that the very notion of the monotheism taught in the West is the wrong one. The true monotheism is the monotheism of the black people. So we have to capitalize on this schema, the, 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 the impossibility of their monotheism, the scientific nature of our religion, the scientific nature of our, of our monotheism, to, to come to the unity of Africa to, 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 to get away from those schemas, those the necessary to, to, to gain the other people to have a religion. We belong to the same religion. Thank Let you for me that. say this. The yeah, physician yeah, I told, the physician of Inyele I, I, I spoke about, his name he was his name is Libondo. Libondo. Thank you for that. Thank you for the reference also. You see, I don't think it really requires rocket science to understand that the spirituality in Africa is the first and it must be the original. Because this is where humanity was born. Mm -hmm. This is where humanity have lived for several thousands and thousands of years before they ever got to Europe and other parts of the world. I think Europe, in fact, was even the last piece of land to be occupied because it was too cold. You simply cannot stay there. So for European now to come and say, uh, yeah, yeah, it's like you have to say something there. Uh, I want to stress this. 
because in, in my introduction, I said that according to the black people, the universe started in an eddy of water, which is situated in the east. Now, if you are in Japan, they will tell you you are at the extreme east. And if you come near, you arrive at Iraq, they will tell you you are near east. So the east was Egypt in ancient time. The east was Africa. So the African people knew that the humanity started here in the <laughs> east. <laughs> Uh, there is there is there is no there is no debate about that at all so yeah it, it where uh, we say we are uh, the spirituality we practice in africa is original it is no out of disrespect to other people in fact i don't even see africa to be conquering other people we just want to be able to live in our continent as owner of this land as people in this land we're not interested in conquering the European. We just want to be allowed to live according to our understanding of life. Without being forced to live like other people, without destroying our culture, without forcing us to do things that we that is not in our in our alignment. This is where the problem really is. It's not because we decided now we want to go and conquer European. That is what we are that is not what we are talking about here. Of course, I agree with you. I agree with you. That is what, 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 why I said we don't hear about a people proselytizing in the past. They never were proselytizing. When the Yoruba met with the flood, they held an exchange of divinities. So that's, that is our true mentality. And we can go back to this by going back to the scientific nature of our religion, our traditional religion. All right, for the, for the sake of the argument, um, is ancient Kemet spirituality a form of paganism? How did it become that, if some people think that is the way it is? You know, the term paganism was used by the Vatican in order to disparage Africa. And in order to hide also a big truth, after the invasion of the northern part of Africa, which was then inhabited by the black people, those black people who were called in the Morris, the Morris, were converted to island. They went through Gibraltar and they reached Europe and they brought civilization to the Spanish people and to the Portuguese. That's how the light of civilization came to the white people. But as they were marrying with, white, with white, white lady, most of them came to be, came to, when came, became white. And eventually, the, white, the, black, the white people got their independence from the Moors, And what they did, they tried to hide the truth that they were once dominated by the black people. Now, I tell you, see the flag of Sardinia and see the flag of the isle which is south of France and this, the isle which is south of Italy. Both flags contain a black face hanged, a black face being hanged. Why? Because they were first dominated by the black people who brought them, brought them civilization. So after they expelled the black people and they began to call them pagan. So how we are not pagan, we are worshiper of the true God, the God who is transcendent, the only God whose existence can be demonstrated. We are not pagan. We have been labeled pagan by the Vatican. We are not so. 
and we don't have to admit this anymore because our religion is an exact science. Theirs is a mere belief. All right. Let's talk about how the spirituality was lived in ancient Kemet. Is it like maybe going to uh, to the temple on on Saturday, on Friday, on Thursday at one time to worship, maybe at the end of the week, or is it something that was done every day, three times a day? Uh, I want to understand how the ordinary people live with their spirituality. Help us understand that. It is difficult for us to know those schemas. But we know one thing. We know that the temple were not used for, t- for, uh, for, for teaching religious matter to people every, every Sunday or every Friday. Or, no. The temple were used for t- initiating people, and the temple were used for healing purpose. So people went to the temple in order. The temple were where the former universities. And they were also hospitals. You see the same schema about the Congo people. The Congo people use the forest as the temple. And they will go there. Not to, they will go there only to be told, but it is only the only the elite that will go there to be taught. It they were as university. They were initiatory schools, and other people will, be go, will go there in order to be healed. So what I mean is this, the temple were used to train the elite. Now, back to the society, those elite have to care for the, for the, the family, the extended family, They have to teach them higher ethics. They have to teach them the laws of God. So it belongs to them within the family to do this. It it was not the mother of someone foreign to the family, from outside the family. No. The teaching of the people was a matter relevant to the high priest of the family. Every family had its priest, its high priest, and the country had also a high priest. That was the the spiritual organization of the ancient people. Thank you so much for that. Um, Now, I want to ask you a question relating to um, the pyramids. Uh, because we are talking of spirituality and try to bring the image out better so at least you can see it well um the question i have to ask you relate to the shape of the of the pyramid are they in any way linked to spirituality or does it have any significance uh, in the coming uh, spirituality i think that the purpose one of the purposes it is difficult to know for us to know all the purposes for which pyramid were built, but one of them was to show the superior nature of the science of the Egyptian in connection to the science of the other people. The Egyptian knew that after 3,000 years, their civilization will go in a kind of hibernation. They will sleep in order for the another civilization, which is a lower one, to appear. And they knew also that after another 3,000 years, their civilization will again awake. We are now at the time when that civilization, the black civilization, had to awake. So the pyramid stands there to show out the superiority of solar science and solar technology. Now, many schema has been devised to try to explain how the pyramid has been, has been built. All of them are failure. This pyramid are there to show that they were built through black science and black technology, which is mostly a mental one. As I spoke about Ibondo, who after 
operating a surgical intervention made the hood disappear instantly. That was a mental thing. And that it is a mental practice this, which was known in Africa. However, science, however, technology are based on the existence existent of spirits. And I have demonstrated that we can prove that reality is spiritual while the white people cannot prove that reality is material. So the pyramid stands for the superiority of our spirituality, our science, and our technology. But it's a way to ask, uh, to really demonstrate the, the mental aspect of uh, or maybe the building of the pyramid, for example, somebody were curious, you want to know, you need an explanation. What, what kind of explanation would be there to satisfy the curiosity of such an individual? Let me start by, 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 by these things. When you govern France by being in Paris, and we know that France has a centralized system of government, you need two technologies a technology of communication and a technology of locomotion. Without those two technologies, you cannot govern France by using a centralized schema. Now, we are told that the Kingdom of Congo was four times bigger than France. How can, can they tell us that though that kingdom which had a centralized system of government, was governed without a technology of locomotion and without the technology of communication. This is a lie. And when we insist, they say, oh, you know, well, you were using tam-tams tam -tam in order to communicate. But that is false. How can I use the tam, tam in order to give this lecture? It is impossible. So the conclusion is that there have been a technology of locomotion, there have been a technology of communication, which we was using mainly mental communication. The black people know that there is a spirit in everything. Every, every nature of a thing is a spirit. Heaviness, the heaviness of a stone is a spirit. So the priests of ancient Egypt could speak to the spirit of the heaviness of a stone. He could tell, he, he could tell, tell to the, that spirit, please, get away of the stone for a moment. And then he, this, the stone will be as light, has a leaf of a, a, a leaf of pa a paper, a piece of paper, and he will carry it and arrange it and then say to the spirit of heaviness, come back. That is the way the pyramid were built, not in another way. They use this mental technology. The same technology was used for communication, for locomotion, even for surgery. Well, to tell you, I fully understand that. Um, I will be lying to myself, but I need a bit of explanation. <laughs> <laughs> you, need, you need a lot of explanation. Even scientifically speaking, a lot of scientists still cannot explain it, how the pyramid actually were built. Uh, it is difficult to explain. I think even the Japanese did uh, try to do a replica of the pyramid. It was a failure. They couldn't do it. So even with the advancement in technology today, yeah, some of them are still difficult to understand. I get what you're saying in the, in the meta part of it, but even that too, uh, we need more of the explanation. Yeah, we need more of the explanation to be able to explain to the people. Or maybe we don't really need to understand how it was built maybe that is not even important um i don't know I, i'm just i'm just thinking aloud but it is not as simple as it is as it appears yeah <laughs> i yes, think please. i think what do we need the most 
is a tool of, of is a scientific explanation. And now the scientific explanation is what I call the chemical cosmological argument. If you can prove that reality is spiritual, that everything is solved. The difficulty we have is that the black, the white people has set us in a cage. The cage is the belief that reality is material. Because if reality is material, then we cannot use the spirit to explain, to explain things. But we have proven, thanks to the chemical cosmological argument, which is an exact science, that reality is spiritual. And I think that that is what we need. We need a logical proof. And the logical proof is there. All we do have to do now is to use it in order to defend our culture, our technology, our traditional technology. All right. Thank you for that again. But I do have some questions. Yes. Um, in that, uh, first, what is this knowledge now that was used to build the like of ancient Zimbabwe, uh, even ancient Benin, for example, because I am from Edo State, uh, the capital city of Edo State is Benin. So I am actually uh, a descendant of the same people that built the ancient uh, Benin city and the ancient Benin empire. One description of ancient Benin is that there were street lights at the, at mm -hmm. the peak of the, of the empire. Of course, I'm not talking of thousands of years. This is only a few hundreds of years ago. Of course, street light, uh, it didn't mean that this light was powered by electricity the way we have it today. It could have been that maybe they put a lamp there. But the concept was very clear. The road were like paved, but not really paved, but it was so clean that you could see that the road was constructed. They were straight line. But the fact that somebody could think of it that in the night you don't have light, you need a street light to power throughout the night, this was an advanced form of, of society. But today, if you go to the say, Benin or Benin city in Nigeria, it's almost like a disarray, as it were. So it means that in the time past, there were really this knowledge, whether they are only at the level of metaphysics or physical, the people could really do extraordinary thing. But where has this knowledge gone? Whether we are talking of ancient Zimbabwe, the ancient city of Benin, the builder and the, const and the constructor, the designer, or the ancient chemist. Because all across Africa today, we are suffering. We are basically suffering. We are even finding it difficult to identify our left from our right. So where has the knowledge gone? I will tell you this. The knowledge is there. The knowledge is still there. All we need is a communication with those who possess that knowledge. Let me start by giving you an example in my own life. I have a doctoral degree, a PhD honor degree of theology from the Trinity Graduate School of Apologetic and Theology of Kerala in India. I had to write a thesis in order to graduate from, from that school. I wrote my thesis in three weeks. I say three weeks not more. When I mention this, people say to me, it is impossible. It was not a bogged thesis. That thesis was published by Armatan in Paris. It was reviewed by a scientific journal of the University of Toulouse in, in France. So it kept the attention of the scientific community. But how could I happen to write that thesis in three weeks? My answer is that 
I as an African scientist, I don't rely mostly on my brain like will an, a European scientist do. I mostly rely on my intuition, my intuitions. Now, what is intuition in Africa? Intuition is someone talking to you. Intuition is just an ancestor speaking to you. The more you listen to him, the more clear he will be speaking to you. The less you listen to him, he will be discouraged and go. What I mean here is that those who had those knowledge are still there. When they had gone, they didn't tell you that I'm dying. No, I, I, don't, I don't know an African elder who, when he come to the last point, he said that he will die. No, they say, I'm making a trip. I'm going. So they know that they are still there. They are just, they are just turning their back. And they know that you, they still can communicate with you. In reality, those people who possess that knowledge, those knowledge cannot go higher unless they communicate that knowledge with us. But there is a prerequisite for them to do this. We have first to re-establish re the fundamental. What was the fundamental? When we learn the ancient Egyptian culture, we learn that the fundamental was the divine mystery, the divine knowledge, their scientific religion. That was the basis of everything. So that's why I, for one, started with Nzilaloa, which is a school of divine mystery. We have to reestablish that divine mystery. Then we will have people who can communicate consciously with those gone alight, and they will have those knowledge. The knowledge is there. We have only to know how to communicate with them. We don't have to rely on the white people's schema, which, which impinge on us that when, which impinges on us that when something dies, that's the hand. No, there is not a hand for a white black, black man. Death is not the cessation of life. Death is the transition to another kind of life, another plan of consciousness. That is powerful. It is powerful. Um, especially when you come to understand the fact that the way we really organize ourselves in Africa today, it is completely away from our consciousness, from our understanding of life, from our spirituality, <laughs> It's like you are abandoning your ancestors and you want to have peace. I think it's difficult. It's like you are abandoning your culture, you want to have peace. <laughs> it is difficult because it's like you are taking a fish out of the water and the fish is going to be celebrating. It is difficult. Uh, talking of this power, I'm not an expert of this, but I am just thinking as a human being, I'm just reflecting. Now, let me give another example in Nigeria. In fact, I'm going to give two. In Nigeria, when we want to swear in the, the ruling elites, we usually use the constitution. Of course, the constitution is a valid document in Nigeria, and of course, we use the Bible or the Quran. Those are also valid. I'm not saying they are not valid. But they, those, those documents are not able to hold our, our politicians accountable for the enormous corruption. Now, what can be the alternative? Say maybe, for example, somebody among the Igbo is a leader, a governor of a state. 
Instead of maybe using the constitution, this individual is taken to the shrine of Amadi Oha to swear that he will defend his people. He will not steal from the people. I can guarantee you, even in 2022, that individual will not steal. Because deep inside us, we understand the value of our ancestors, the value of our belief system. Let me give you another example. I live in Italy. Up until recently, Italy was a very bad name for Nigerians. Is that a lot of Nigerian women come here to do prostitution. I know that prostitution everywhere. And predominantly, the people that are doing prostitution in Italy predominantly are from my state, which is a do state. This is the state, these people actually have disreputed the, the image of Nigeria and the great Benin people. But one day, the urban of Benin decided to place a ban, decided to make a course on whoever will do prostitution in the way that they have been doing it in Italy. Guess what happened? Suddenly, it stopped. Suddenly, just suddenly, it stopped. This is all in confirmation that the ruling, uh, that is power. There is also respect for the power. Of course, that is why it exists. If we don't respect it, they don't exist. Which means, if we are governing ourselves based on our history, based on where we are coming from, based on our relationship with our ancestors, there is no way we can be where we are today. But if we are like the fish that is out of the water, like we are in Africa, it is becoming difficult for us to find peace because we are trying to find peace through the lens of another person. What do you have to say about that? I told you that since the white people came here, we live in a cage, in an epistemological cage. We have, they have convinced her that reality is material which means that when someone dies, everything stops. There is no life after death. That is the cage. With that cage, our system is completely spoiled. We believe that the only good we, we, we can afford is the good which is in the cage. This is not the way black people were behaving before the arrival of, of the white people. Let me give you a life example of someone who was, who was one of the, the, the managing body of a big company here in Congo. When he was a toddler, he will have to walk five kilometers in order to attend school. And because his dad, his dad was dead by that time, he was gay, go, going to school without having whatever to eat. So he was all the time thirsty, thirsty. Then one day, his dad came to him in a dream and told him, I'm going to help you. You know, when you go to school, you pass, you pass through, you pass through a walk through a, a river. You cross a river. Now, after crossing that river, see the little bush which is on that side, on the side. So when he woke up, he said, "Oh, I saw my father in a dream." He went to he went to school and came back came back again without looking on that bush. In the night his father came again. The same dream was repeated three times. So the third time when he was going to school, he arrived at the, at the river. He called the dream. And she said, look, let us look. What is in that bush? What, why you, that, the, that my father is appearing always to me. He went to the bush. He looked and he sold two pieces of money, two francs. 
two, Bel two Congolese friends. That was enough money for a student who, who had food at school. So what was happening since then, every time he will arrive there, he will look at the bush and take two francs and go to school. That's how he happened to manage all his primary school schooling. So this is possible only by being out of the cage. By being in the cage, we are cut from our ancestor. So it is impossible for us to organize ourselves as they did. So the first thing we have to do is an epistemological revolution. We have to use the chemical cosmological argument to convince ourselves of the validity of our way of thinking. This is, I think, the most important thing. We have to convince ourselves. We don't have to weigh the approval of the white people. We have to convince ourselves logically by using that tool of apologetics that reality is spiritual. And because reality is spiritual, we have to move toward our own way of thinking, to move back toward our own way of thinking, our own way of doing religion, of doing science, and then we will be strong as the Egyptian were. You have speak something about swearing by using the Bible. I was told this in my culture. Whenever a Congo people made that gesture by saying Nzambi, he means that he is ready to die if what he said is not true. Burkina Faso means the land of the honest people. Honesty was something that was for, on which the African were not, were, were in transitions. To be, to say the truth was something that was a mark on all the, of, of the respect of the divinities. Thank you so much for that, sir. All right, for all of you that are watching, that are listening to us, do you find any value in what we are discussing here? If you do, make sure you, you let us know. Leave your comment. Help us to understand what you feel about the conversation that we are having today. Because we are here for you. And I want to single out something here. When we talk of uh, maybe the ancestors, it might appear as something that, ah, we are talking of fetish things here. Ah, they have gone there again talking stupid things. But now, think for a moment. Maybe you are in the United States. Have you ever gone to the museum? Have you gone to the state house? Have you uh, maybe heard of uh, the, the Washington Memorial? Maybe uh, the Tom Jefferson's? Do you see the images on the street? What about the currency that you use? Okay, say maybe, for example, you are in Italy. Have you gone to Vatican? What about the images you see on the street? Who are those images? Go to the museum again. No, maybe take up a, uh, a Euro B and see who do you see there? What about the book? Who are the people that are written about there again and again and again on a continuous loop? These are the ancestors of the people. So when we talk of ancestors, remembering people that have made impact in our life, it's not like we are trying to uh, bewitch you into a uh, little fetish, little fetish thing. We are simply telling you to value where you are coming from, to value who you are, your true self. Because if we respect who we are, if we believe in our common existence as a people, 
is that we have one ancestors. Say maybe for example, among the Benin people now, among the Yoruba people. Let's take it even further than that. Let's say among the Ghanaian people that we have common destiny, we are going to a place. If we, if we can believe that, because the, the most difficult part of it is to believe it, if we can accept that, it will be difficult for us not to walk according to that. That is why I think it is very important for us to have a bearing, to understand our bearing. Where are we going? On what basis do we want to live? And if we like, why not even die? Yes, please, sir. That's why I'm stressing that the true nature of African traditional religion is an exact science. Science means demonstration. Science is universal. If you don't believe in science, that you are, then you are in a you are in a mess. And now we are speaking of an exact science. So I think the fundamental thing for us is to recourse in that scientific nature of our religion. Yeah, yeah. You're right. You're right, sir. What we are talking about is actually science because it's evident. What we are talking about is evident. It's true. We can see it. We can see exactly what we are saying. I'm not expanding the area, but we can see what we are talking about. All right. You did make mention of um, uh, Trinity, the way you were talking uh, before about the Kemet um, uh, ancient religion and spirituality. I don't know if you want to expand on that a little bit uh, for people to understand better. When I speak of Trinity, it is not the Christian Trinity, which, which, which is a, a, a a mistaken concept. The Christian Trinity makes of God the most intricate being, which is wrong. God has to be simple because simplicity, we call, because we said God is indivisible. Because he's indivisible, he's infinitely simple and infinitely intelligent, infinitely loving. He, he, he is all of that. God is not a complicated being. Let me speak first a little bit about Christian Trinity in order to make a difference with, with what I have spoken of. Christian Trinity actually started with Plato. After starting in ancient Egypt, we know that Plato was not told the true religion of Egypt as the other Egyptian student. None of them was told that true religion. But when you live among people who practice their religion, even though they don't teach you this, you can keep some schema of that, that religion through their practice. So in that way, Plato got some glimmers of, of the religion of ancient Egypt. So he tried to compose this and to explain the deity. But he confused the Logos and the Creator. He confused them as this one and same being. And then he recalled that the priests were speaking about Trinity. And then she said, but I have only two entities here, the Supreme Being and the Creator who is also the Logos. What am I, am, am I going to do? So he asked, he added a third entity, which he called the, the CK, which is the spirit. And that, the, and that way, the Trinity became God the Father, God the Child, and God the Holy Spirit, which is a wrong Trinity, which make of God an intricate being. Now, we have seen through the chemical cosmological argument that there are three celestial entities. The God, the Father, the Mother, the Most High, the children of God, all the potential and effective creators, and the Logos. So we have the Father, Mother, the Child of God, and the Logos. 
both are one. One in substance, because they share the same substance. One in existence, God cannot exist without the existence of his children. And one in activity. And I said that that Trinity is like one standing in front of a mirror. He has a, his image in the mirror, and he has the power of the reflection of the mirror. If he moves, his image moves thanks to the power of the reflection. And that is a trinity of inactivity. The logos is the power of the reflection of the fullness of God in each one of us. So that is true trinity. True trinity means that God is always working in us in order for us to be his children. But God never violates our free will. So it is up to you to accept that grace or to turn it off. So in that sense, when we are talking of Trinity, according to the comment, um uh, religion or spirituality, we are talking of one entity, right? We are talking of God being present in you and me, working in you and me for our salvation right now. When we need something, God is transcendent. When we need something, we ask our holy ancestors and our holy ancestors communicate with us because there is a divinity in us. So there is only three things working, the divinity, the logos, and the one who is the receptor. So that's what I'm calling, it's a practical trinity. It means that God is always with you, working in you through the logos. But God is transcendent. Also, he is, he, he is working through the ancestors, and the ancestors are working through the, the temporal presence of the logos in you, which is called Ores, which is called in among the Bakongo, uh, Kimawungu, which is expressed when we call the right part, the male part, and the left part, the female part, we mean the completeness of God in us. All right. So now, uh, I need some more explanation here. So the Supreme God, uh, is, is it a, a male or female or male and female? Can you say anything about that? And I, 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 told, I say that so the culture of Sumer is the same Culturally, Sumer belong to Africa. Culturally, Africa culturally extended up to the the the, 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 Noah, the Iraq as Ethiopia extended up to Yemen. Now, the god of Sumer, the supreme being in Sumer, is called Anu. And they will tell you that, hey, yes, he has a wife. His wife is Antu. No. I don't agree with that. Agree with that. Let's take another schema. Osiris. They will tell you, yes, Osiris has a wife. His wife is this. No, that is false. The God were presented as being both male and female. That doesn't mean a, a, a man and his wife no that means a female nature and and a male nature both united so the gods like human beings are male and female the conjunction of the male and the female element means in this religion the completeness of being the divine completeness of being the presence of the Logos. Mm, all right, that's powerful. That's very clear here. Uh, I want to attempt the question like this. What is the origin of Egyptian, okay, now let me not use the word Egyptian, Asian Kemet religion or spirituality. Uh, can we say anything about the origin? Where is it coming from? Did it start in Asian Kemet? Did it come from some parts in Africa? 
Mm. Anything you can say about that? Now, this is my conviction. If religion is a knowledge, if it is a knowledge coming from God, then that knowledge must be infinitely clear. Humanly speaking, we know that a knowledge of that way must be an exact science. So an exact science is something that depicts the nature of the true religion coming from God. Now, if you study the epistemology of the Egyptian, you will see that they mostly relied on revelation. I don't know in Nigeria, but I'm sure you don't have a verb in Yoruba, in Igbo, to say, conceive. I conceived an idea. No, the black people will always say, I received an idea. An idea came to me. That means that for the African people, knowledge is always revelation. So, because the white people realized mostly on a revelation, that true revelation was revealed, that true religion was revealed to him. And that's why the religion, which is an exact science, is, was among the Egyptian, was known by the Egyptian, because that was the true religion in the beginning. Remember, According to the Bible, the first, the first humans were civilized by the gods. This is not only told in the Bible, in every African culture. If you take the culture of the Baganda, they will tell you that at the beginning they were Kintu. Kintu was alone in, on the earth, and the sons of God, Gulu, came. And they came with bulls and they taught Hindu, how to be civilized. This schema can be demonstrated through the chemical cosmological argument. But this is not the point. Let me just stress this. The creator had to descend in order to create. But when he descend, he is at a locus, which is the junction between the heaven and the heaven, the, the earth, the earth plane, the heavenly realm and the temporal realm, he is at the junction. He can go lower because to go lower, you must be one who, who, have, who, who misused his free will. He never misused his free will. So he can, he can go lower. So those who are lower have to be civilized by those who have been civilized already by the creator. That's the explanation of what you read about the story of Kintu, the story of the Nephilite in uh, Nephilim in the Bible that the gods came to civilize the human beings. All right. I, I, I need to ask you some things there. When you were talking of uh, creation before, that was, uh, I think, uh, sometime in the, towards the beginning of the lecture, uh, you did make mention of the fact that God created... Um, God created something from what was already in existence. I don't know if I if I quote you correct on that. Or the, I was, yeah, yeah, I was trying to I was trying to explain the difference between creation in Africa and creation in the West. In the West, creation is the work of the most high, which is impossible because to create is to change. So that's that's the first point. But creation in Africa, in, in, in the process of creation in Africa, something goes from potential existence to manifest existence. So according to African worldview, everything exists. There is, for the time being, a big wall bombing in Lagos. But you don't hear about this because there is not a military taking the initiative to make it go from potentiality to manifest existence. So nobody, nobody cares about that war, but it's just a potential war, a potential one. So potentially everything exists. 
to create is to make something go from potential existence to manifest existence. So when the children of God misuse their free will, they fail in a state of potential existence. Because remember, God is indivisible. When you turn your back to God by the bad use of free will, you turn your back to the wholeness of God. But you cannot be annihilated. Why? If you were annihilated, relationally, God will change. God will lose his relationship with, with something. Now we have seen that God is absolutely unchanged, immutable. That's why when someone misused his free will, he became a non-incarnated spirit. And creation consists in helping those non-incarnate spirits get out of chaos, out of darkness, and get a manifest temporal form in order for them to begin the ascension back to the heavenly realm. All right. This potential, <laughs> that's interesting. This potential, is it possible to say that, uh, because I find it interesting, the fact that everything is possible, everything is in existence. I think those in the metaphysics, uh, the so-called new science, they talk about this a lot too. Okay, now we'll be talking of uh, manifestations that if you, can, if you can think of it, if you can imagine it, then you can bring it to fruition. Maybe if we even take the Bible now, uh, God say, let there be light. We didn't see, okay, using the Bible now, we didn't really see God created light. God just said, let there be light, and there was light. Which means, in that chaos that it was, in this soup in the beginning of creation, there was already light and darkness. He didn't really create light. He just manifested it, and it came to mm -hmm. be. Yes. So, yeah, it makes sense to me. It makes a lot of sense there. But who put this possibility there? Is it living out of uh, chance? Is it God that first created this, uh, this possibility that he himself manifests and all of us can also manifest? How did that possibility come to be those, that everything is possible? Help me with that, please. First, remember that potential existence is not true existence. That must be clear. I spoke about the war being in Lagos just now. Missiles are falling on Lagos, but don't look at the news. It's just potential war. As long as there is not a general to take the initiative to make it manifest, it will remain potential and nobody will care about that. So potential existence is not an existence. Now, let's go back to the fundamental. We demonstrated, I stress the fact that we demonstrated that the Most High is transcendent and is indivisible. And we demonstrated that the Most High, the, the, because he is indivisible, the Most High expresses his wholeness in each one of his children. Now, by expressing his wholeness in a child, he's manifesting love, affection. Because God manifests infinite affection to an infinite number of children, he must be the principle, the source of affection. He must be love with uppercase L. So God is love, the principle of love. Second thing, we have seen that God is absolutely immutable. We have, we have demonstrated this. I stress the fact that the fact of demonstration because we are in a scientific religion. And since God is absolutely immutable, he can change his mind and say, okay, because obey, he doesn't 
believe in me, I will take away the logos in him. I will take away my fullness in him. No, God can never deprive deprive human beings of the logos because he is unchangeable, which means that God is eternally loyal to his children. That, that means that God expresses infinitely a quality of truth to an infinite number of children, infinite, an infinite number of children. So this means that God is truth with capital T. God is the principle of truth. Now, because God is love and God is truth, his love for you and me is a true love. A true love cannot be pushed by a gun. No. A true love cannot be compulsory. No. Because God loves us with a true love, this implies that we are free. It is that freedom which brings in the notion of a potential existence of evil. Because if there were not evil, then we are not free. Then there, there will not be a choice. Then there will be only good. But because we are truly free, as God is truth, God is love, then we have a choice. And because we have a choice, evil exists. That, that evil is only potential. And potential existence is not true existence. So beware. Whoever will make that evil go from potential existence to manifest existence, he will be the responsible for that evil, that manifest evil. All right. That's great. <laughs> that's interesting. The equation is, uh, is very interesting. Um, but I have a question. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. So, I read a book one time. The book is mm -hmm. called The Science of Getting Rich. So, at the point, yeah. um, Wallace was saying that anything is possible. Anything is possible because uh, the thing that you use to create, the same substance that you can use to create things, is the same substance that God used to create us. And these substances are infinite. There is no limit to it. So we shouldn't live on scarcity. We should live on abundance. In that there is enough for everybody in this world. Even if the population were to multiply, okay, I'm the one added this one now, or to times two, there is still enough to go around for everybody. Because we haven't reached the end yet of what we can create. Because the substance that you use to create things, they are absolutely infinite they are infinite now that lead me now to talking about god where did god get the material to create us his children does it mean he manifested us from the abundance that is available so we are object or the proceed of his manifestation that's what I'm trying to understand there. There are two things here. I was first to clarify the, the things on visualization, which is what is taught about being rich. And then I will respond, you added the material for creation. So there are two things for me. Let me first think about visual, visualization. They tell that everything is there, you have just to fix your, your, your mentality on it, and it will happen in our life. I don't agree with this. This is, this is not what is taught in Africa. The healing process, the spiritual healing process in Africa means going from perfection and denying the imperfection as being a mere suggestion. Let, us, let, let me give you an example. Someone came to me and told me, please, 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 I'm fainting, I'm fainting. I think that I, 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 I'm going to die, I'm going to die. I instantly told him that 
there is no death in the universe of God. And there is no fainting because man is the image of God just now. Just so just now you are well, you are fine. And what is being manifest, being trying to manifest itself as it is, is, is exaggeration coming to you and coming to me. I don't accept this and you don't have to. And instantly he told, he told me, I'm fine. It's all gone away. I'm fine. He has always been fine, but he didn't know it. I didn't do anything. I just awakened him to what he had already been. If you start from the point of view that you are the image of God, and then has the image of God, everything is in you, then you, you will not be working to get something but to prove that you are perfect. That is correct. Visualization, has, it is told by those people is that you are imperfect. You lack something, but by having it enter your thought, it will appear in your experience. That's what I said is wrong. You start from imperfection. You start from mental imperfection in order to reach perfection. I don't start that way. We have to start from spiritual perfection. We are the image of God. And from that point of view, we have all we need. And we stick on these up to the point that the suggestion of lack, the suggestion of lack will disappear. Now let us go back to the, the material of creation. You have to understand that according to the chemical cosmological argument, that is according to science, because it is exact science. At the beginning, before the beginning, God already existed with his children. When the children of God turned away from, from God, that is, he used, he used his bad, his free will, what happens? What happens is a dream. He falls in a dream. That's the way you should understand this. We have fallen in a dream. What the creator did, he put himself also in a dream. But the difference between his dream and our dream is that we are not conscious of dreaming while he knows that what is going on in a dream is a dream. So when he came, he only, he only managed to have people understand that it is a dream. So people are waking up to the reality. What is going on is waking up to the reality. It is not a new material being implemented, no. It is not a new material be, which be, is being used, no. The same material. We are now children of God in heaven, now. Not we shall, we will be, no. Now we are in heaven. What is going on here is just a dream. So we are awakening from that dream. So there is not new material. That's why the chemical cosmological argument proved to us that reality is spiritual. There is not material, material things. There are no material substance that is false. There is only one substance, the spiritual, and we have to awaken to that reality. Thank you. I like the, the subject of awakening. And I also thank you also uh, for your explanation, for responding to all this curiosity. Where I just happen to ask a lot of questions. Where that is why also I'm here. And that is why you are watching me out there. Because I ask questions and I love it. Yes. All right. Now, for people that are listening to you, uh, they might want to know more about you. They might like to read your books. They might like to, uh, uh, why not patronize you? So I want you to use these few seconds to promote yourself. How can people connect with you? How can people uh, buy any of your book? Uh, please go ahead and do that. Yes, yes, an African priest, an African Nganga, as we say here, I make a research. I initiate people 
to the African to the practice of African spiritual spirituality, which is essentially the practice of spiritual healing. And the reason I I initiate people to that practice, and also I have written books. My books are available at Amazon, so you can get at uh, at Amazon. I just Google my name at Amazon, search Luya Luca, and you will see all my books are available there. If you want to patronize me. You can write me. My email is kia tezua. That is k i a t e z u a l l at yahoo dot f r. Or you can just, if you forget, you can just ask the question for the comments on this uh, video, and I'm going to give you this information. I thank you so much. You're welcome, sir. Before I ask you the last question, I want you to uh, say something about your name, Luya Luca. Tell us something about it. What does it mean? What does it signify? My name is Kiatezwa Lubanzadio Luya Luca. First, the, 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 the funny thing is that Kiatezwa is the name of my father, Lubanzadio is the name of my mother. And Luyaluka is the name of my great grand, my grandfather, the father of my father. So that name, Luyaluka, is what we call him Humbu and Humbula. It means that my ancestor Luyaluka is supposed to care to, to protect me. So truly, my name is Luyaluka. Now, Kyatezwa means that something that, ha that has been judged, that, that has, has been measured by God. God has measured that thing. Kiatezwa. Lubanzadio means think about it. Think about it because that thing has been measured by God. And Luyalu come in, so you evil spirit, get away. <laughs> That's powerful. I, I love that. That's powerful. <laughs> I know that there were going to be deep significance to the day, but thank you so much for really explaining it to us. Yeah, I know. Thank you, you are for, Thank you so much, sir. All right. So what would be your final thought here in this conversation uh, where we talked about uh, spirituality and religion in nation Kemet? Uh, how would you conclude it? My final thought is that spirituality and religion is about regaining how lost manifest nature has children of God. We are children of God. And the practice of the spirituality of our ancestors consists in purifying our thoughts in order for us to become back to manifest children of God we have been. To be a children of God means that we have all the good that, God, that belongs to God in us. We have the right to live these goods. And the way to the, the highest way to this is the purification of thought. And let us also remember that that religion of our ancient is an exact science. So we have to bring back that dimension of our, of the religion of our, of our ancestor in present trends of African traditional religion. This will bring the true elevation of Africa. Will we, this will bring the Pan-Africanist unity that we are seeking since the time of the Web Boys and others, Afri African Pan-Africanists. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. I appreciate it. This has been really very interesting. Thank you. Welcome. If you enjoy this podcast, make sure you subscribe so you never miss any of our future episodes. Rate and review Obehead Podcast and share with your friends who might need it. I remain Obehead Ewafo. Thank you so much for listening and talk to you in the next episode.